and we're going to talk about the final judgment. What are we going to be judged on when we finally meet our maker? Ooh! <laughs> you know, lots of people are worried about that. So this is Matthew chapter 25. From verse 31 on. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? or naked and clothed you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you curse into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So you want to turn off your cell phones, please, because that bothers me. The format for the Bible study is that I speak, you listen, do not ask me questions during the Bible study. Save them until the end because that interrupts me. So if you have questions, write them down. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we just heard this very famous passage of Scripture, Matthew chapter 25. It's what guided Mother Teresa in her own life. When somebody asked Mother Teresa when she would be bandaging up these people on the street, smelly people, people who had maggots, people who had leprosy, all sorts of diseases, and they 
asked her, and one reporter especially said to Mother Teresa, I wouldn't do what you are doing for a million dollars. And Mother Teresa looked at the reporter and said, well, I wouldn't either. <laughs> but I do it for Jesus. I do it for Jesus and to Jesus. Whatsoever you do to these the least of my brothers and sisters, you do it to me. That's basic Christianity. The incarnation, which we repeat in each and every creed at Mass, that God became flesh, God became men, and God continues to become flesh, incarnate in the people around us. So what we do to others, we do to Jesus. It's that idea that God does not have any other body but yours and the body of those around you. If I want to love God, I have to love other people. All people, not just those I want to love. Huh? And I have to love the hell out of people. Huh? <laughs> That's what we are called to do. It's easy to say, oh, I love God when God is some sort of an idea floating out there. But it's harder to say, I love God in the people around me because people hurt me, they betray me, they do horrible things to me. And yet that is our calling. In Romans verse 13, excuse me, chapter 13, Verse 8, the book of Romans. Paul says, Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. So all of the law, the rules and everything else, is not if we do not love people and accept people and care for people. Now, Paul, the author of the book of Romans, he had his own conversion experience. And he's blinded on the road to Damascus, and Jesus speaks to him. It's a very famous story. And Jesus says to him, because Paul, who was Saul before he became Paul, he was a great persecutor of Christians. He was responsible for killing, killing lots and lots of Christians. He was a Pharisee. He was a member of the Pharisaic sect of Judaism. Just like Christianity has divisions today. You know, there's Methodists, Orthodox, Presbyterians, Catholics, you know, all that, okay? Judaism to this very day, just like before, during Jesus' time, had sects in there. S-E-C-T-S. -E okay? And Paul was part of the Pharisaic sect. You've heard of the Pharisees. They're mentioned a lot in the Bible. It's just a division. They were strict adherents to the rules and regulations. If you had to place Jesus in one of the sects of Judaism, he would fit into that particular one because Jesus did not come to get rid of any of the rules or the commandments. Jesus came to fulfill the law. Remember, he said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but I came to fulfill the law, to explain the law to us. What does it mean? What do all of these rules and regulations mean? And Paul is this strict adherent, this defender of purity. We have a lot of defenders of purity out there, don't we? Huh? And Paul was this great defender of purity. And boom! He has his conversion experience. He's blinded on the road to Damascus. And Jesus speaks to him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? Now, who was he persecuting? He was persecuting the Christians, the church. In other words, Jesus is equating himself with us. 
You are Jesus. And those around you are Jesus. You get it? He ain't, he ain't got no body but yours. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful body. Huh? Yeah. Every morning you should look at yourself and say, mm. <sighs> huh? as you perfume yourself like I did today. Huh? Because your body is the body of Jesus. Now, why did uh, Paul have his name changed? Because it's, a, it's, it's, it's this sign of a new identity, that it, uh, becoming a new person. Once we are born again in Jesus, you heard the term born again, being a born again Christian. Yeah. It's very biblical to be born again. You take on a new identity. You're not like you were before. That's what happened to Saul, hence he becomes Paul. At the end of our life, at the judgment, that's Matthew 25 that I just read to you, we won't be asked whether we went to church on Sunday. And so many people need to, they think that that's what it's all about, right? You know, I got my check mark, go to church, and yet I'm a jerk. Huh? Yet I gossip. Huh? But I, 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 I got my check mark, you know, I go to church. I don't eat meat on Friday. It's still the law in Poland. You can't eat meat on Friday. Guess who, eats, guess who eats meat on Friday? Wow. <laughs> My grandmother. <laughs> and I said, I said to her, Grandma, how come you eat meat on Friday? You know, the, 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 the Catholic Church says you, you can't do that. And she says, when I was small, we had no meat. Then, you know, because she lived during Nazism. And I said, well, um, then she says, you know, during communism, we had no food. Okay. And now that we have it. <laughs> So, as long as I don't eat meat on Friday, I'm great. Huh? I go to church. Going to church is good for you, and fasting is good for you, and you should do it because it is good for you, not because you are afraid. Don't do anything out of fear, in other words. My grandmother doesn't do anything out of fear. Hmm? She's not afraid of a God that's going to send her to hell like so many people are. The Bible makes it clear that it's not God who sends us to hell, but other people. We send ourselves to hell and people send us to hell. God doesn't send anybody to hell. God doesn't punish us. We punish ourselves. The Bible makes it clear. We are to do it all out of love. Our motivation should never be fear, but love. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't make you better, in other words, but rather gives you a great responsibility to be better, to rid yourself of jealousy and envy and ill feelings towards others. Those Matthew 25 questions. Did you quench the hungers of others? The hunger to belong. The hunger to be noticed. To feel important. To feel that I matter. That my life matters. Did you do your due diligence to satisfy the thirst of others to be loved? Did you help those around you to find the cup that will satisfy their thirsts. Hmm? I explained yesterday in the homily, which is posted now on my Facebook and on YouTube, what hell is. Hell is not some real place out there uh, that you're going to go to after you die. Hell is a garbage dump, Gehenna, outside of the city of Jerusalem. I explained that to you very well yesterday. It's a state of being. Hmm? Hell, according to the, uh, the Catholic faith, is the absence of God. A garbage dump. 
you know, it says fiery Gehenna. Why? Because it was, you know, there was uh, fires there. They were burning all the time. The, the garbage was being burnt. There's a lot of worms there, maggots and other insects. It's, so when the people of Jesus' time would hear hell, they wouldn't think of something that they're going to experience in the afterlife. They would think of a garbage dump. God doesn't want us in a garbage dump. God wants us where? In heaven, which is the kingdom of God. And heaven is the presence of God. That is the definition of heaven. God doesn't want you to go to heaven after you die only. God wants you to have heaven right now. It's supposed to be, after you pass from here, it's supposed to be a passing from an earthly existence to an eternal existence, but the heavenly existence you should be experiencing now, not just when you die. It's not just something we want when we die. We want heaven now because heaven is God. What is the definition of heaven? It's the presence of God. Do I experience God in my life now? Which means, do I experience love, peace, forgiveness? Huh? And do I offer that to those around me? So what does it mean to hand someone clothes, to clothe people? Is it just, you know, you handing somebody a, a, a shirt? No. Or underwear? No. Okay. It means, are people able to find warmth in my words, in my actions? Or do people find warmth when they talk to you? Are your words warm, inviting? Mm, shh, uh, love, Mwah, kisses, huh? Is that what people experience? There are people who are sick in a variety of ways. Jesus says, did you visit the sick? Mm? Did you, you reach out to people who are sick in all sorts of ways? People who are in all sorts of prisons. Has God visited people how? Remember, G Emmanuel, God has visited his people. Has God visited his people through you? Hmm? Through me. When you come into contact with me, do you experience a visit from God? In Polish, we have a saying, Gość w dom, Bóg w dom. When a guest arrives, I put that right on the website of the parish, divinemercylv.org. Check it out! <laughs> you know, when a guest arrives, God arrives. In Ukrainian, the word for Lord is gospodin, which is uh, a guest. When the guest arrives, God arrives. When we say, the Lord be with you, I'm saying, do you, do you experience that accompanying of the Lord in your life? God visiting me. In fact, there is a uh, Polish tradition, Google it, <laughs> that when you have a meal, an important meal, and it used to be every single meal. Every, it's a Polish tradition. You would set an extra plate with the place setting, the plate, everything there. For that stranger. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says that, you know, when you, when, you, when you welcome the stranger, you welcome me. I'm giving you Christianity 101 here. Basic Christianity. Stop looking for God out there. God is here. Huh? Right here. Huh? Has God visited his people through you? Hmm? You know, speaking of my grandmother, this is the time of the harvest in Poland. And 
when I was growing up. Around the harvest time, my grandfather would go out and would uh, get the wheat and then he would take it to the local mill. There was a big mill in our town. It's no longer a mill right now, but it was a mill and they would take the freshly harvested wheat and they would make flour out of it and he would bring the flour home and she would form bread and bake the bread. And me and my brother were always waiting to eat that freshly baked bread that would be coming out of the oven. And I'll never forget, she takes the bread out of the oven and we're waiting to eat it. And she wraps it up and she says, here, take this bread to the neighbors because they have a lot of children there and they are a lot poorer than we are. Take this bread to the neighbors. This bread, the first bread of the harvest is not meant to be eaten, but to be shared. Take this bread to the neighbors. What a lesson. They have a lot of kids there. We are turned in to bread by Jesus. Isn't that what he said? Take this, all of you. What did he take into his hands? He took bread. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Body. Then Paul says, Who, who's the body of Christ? We, you are the body of Christ. That bread to be shared, not hoarded, not kept. And what do we do? We do the opposite. We don't share. We hoard. Huh? How many stomachs do you have? Only cows have two stomachs. You know, can you eat with two spoons? Well, maybe some people can. What a lesson. What university did my grandmother learn this in? She never went to any school because the Nazis closed all the schools in Poland. And then the communists came in and then they said, you know, you're not good for schooling. You're, all you're good for is work, work, the sickle and the hammer. No God, just work. Where did she learn it? From the University of Jesus Christ. Hmm? from church, from the word of God, heard. She can't read it. Huh? Powerful lessons for all of us to get in our life. Are you that bread? You know, remember, he takes it and he breaks it. Says, take this, all of you. This is my body. What? Gi given up. Do you give yourself up? Do you give yourself up? That's a, an, it's an interesting question that I've been pondering. You know, do I give myself up? Do you give yourself up to your brothers, your sisters, your parents, your grandkids? your husband, your wife? Do you, do, you, do, you, do you give yourself up? He says, take this, all of you. It's, it's easy to come to church, you know, and just receive communion. We love that, don't we? You know, I got, it's me and Jesus. So. Uh. But what are you receiving? You're receiving the real body of Christ to do what? The fathers of the church taught us. We, we, we come to receive what we want to and what we hope to become. I receive the body of Christ to become the body of Christ. Broken body of Christ. Am I broken? Hmm? Am I broken? 
one of the best seminary professors that I had in the seminary, he taught us very well. He says, we don't need priests who are all put together. That's the problem in the church, he says. So many pretenders who think they have it all put together. Hmm? We need broken priests. And I've never forgotten that lesson. That's why I always speak to all of you out of my brokenness, not, uh, not out of my put-togetherness, if that's what you want to call it. You know, I don't pretend that I have it all figured out and put together. No! I'm just as broken as everybody else. And that's okay. And that allows you and gives you permission to be broken too. But he broke us first, all of us. Huh? So, in the Gospel of Luke, we hear that those who humble themselves will be exalted. The tax collector was a sinner, just like each of us. Remember that story of the Pharisee and the tax collector? The problem is that the Pharisee didn't see himself as a sinner. He would stand there and he'd say, Oh, I'm so wonderful. I tithe. I keep all the rules, the regulations. I'm not like this tax collector. I'm not like the rest of the sinners. A lot of people do that today, right? You know, I'm not like the rest of them all. You know, they're all going to hell. And I'm going to heaven because I'm keeping the rules. Great. Huh? Isn't it? You know, I'm, that's what exactly what the Pharisee did with the tax collector in the Gospel of Luke. Hmm? And the tax collector just stood there striking his breast. Why do we strike our breast in the confidior when we say, through my fault, through my fault, through my own grievous fault? Because that's what the tax collector did. He said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Huh? Not like all the ladies who come to confession. And I say ladies because it happens mostly with ladies. Mm -hmm. Father, they start right off, okay? My husband. Right? This, I'm, 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 you know, I'm serious. You all laugh because a lot of you do it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Father, my husband. Huh? I'm like, listen, if your husband wanted to go to confession, he would have come. What are your sins? What are your sins? I don't have any sins, Father. <laughs> I'm just here for the graces of the sacrament. <laughs> well, if you don't have any sins, let's take the statue of Mary down and put you up there. Huh? We're all sinners, all of us. Humble ourselves. We have to humble ourselves. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. The tax collector was a sinner, just like each of us. The problem is that the Pharisee didn't see himself as a sinner. The tax collector did. God knows our hearts and God doesn't see us as bad but it's full of potential. The Pharisees were great pretenders, like certain priests and religious people. Great pretenders who talk about God all the time, but don't get near them without a stick. You know, it's great, you know, the like really nice people up when they do mass, you know, but then don't get near them after. Huh? 
They're jerks after. I mean, who? It's all pretending. That's why I, I want to be the same here as I am with all of you out there. Hmm? What you see is what you get. Whether you like it or not. And some people don't like it. Well, that's okay. You know, I'm not a gold coin to be liked by everybody. You know, you know. Huh? Amen. The Pharisees were great pretenders. Lots of people are great pretenders, pretending, and then they are abrasive. They don't have any warmth. They keep the rules and regulations and commandments. They don't eat meat on Friday. <clears throat> their, but their hearts are full of lies. You know, I'm saying, oh, all the people around me are horrible. I'm so good because I don't eat meat on Friday. <laughs> and I go to church every week. Oh. Uh -huh. I'm so good. You know, this kind of attitude leads to inward depression. Everything is rules, rules, rules. It will get you into depression. I know lots of people like that, okay? Remember, I've been around religious people for a very long time, okay? I've been around a lot of religious people. Hmm? You know, the most rule-keeping and the, the, the most put-together seminarians when I was in the seminary are no longer priests. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. I finished the seminary with seven priests, and only four of us are priests right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I won't even tell you, I mean, all the ones that were with me. And the, the ones who were there... Every, you know, in the chapel, because we had chapel like at five in the morning. The ones who were there at four in the morning, no longer, no longer priests today. But somebody like myself who, you know, you know, we had to wear the cassocks, which is that long black robe. You know, sometimes I'd, I'd be like, oh, I got one minute and I get out of bed and it'd be just a cassock and my underwear <laughs> and run down the hallway. <laughs> It was, I won't get, I won't, never mind. Okay. <laughs> so many people read about all sorts of saints. Next um, Monday, a week from today, is the Feast of St. Francis. And we will have uh, a blessing of animals next week. So bring your pets, okay? Bring your pets next week so that I can bless your animals next Monday. I think I'll get to meet Obi then. Okay. So, um, people want to be like the saints. And they say, well, why am I not like St. Francis? Well, you're not supposed to be St. Francis. You're supposed to be Adam Kotas. Or say your name. Uh, the people who possess this authoritarian faith want to run away from their pain, their wounds. Hmm? Why did Jesus praise the attitude of the tax collector? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus condemned the attitude of the Pharisee who was saying, oh, thank God I'm not like everybody else. Because the tax collector was hungry and was willing to admit his hunger. It's okay to be hungry. Hmm? So now we have the vaccine for um, the COVID-19. Think about the vaccine, okay? Let's let's reflect a little bit about vaccines. You know, there's vaccines not just for COVID, but there's vaccines for all sorts of things that people have taken, like, you know, polio, for example. What is a vaccine? You put bacteria into a body. So 
So you've put bacteria into your body in order to make your body fight, in order for you to be moved into action. Vaccines put disease in your body to make you fight. It moves the body into action. Disease is introduced into you. Have you ever reflected in your life? Your problems, your problems, your suffering, sickness, your issues, the fact that you have fallen. God has allowed it to motivate you to fight. You can fall either into despair or be motivated to fight. Despair is a result of pride. Listen to that. If you fall into despair, it's, a, it's, a, it's part of pride. If you've fallen into despair, you've fallen into the traps of the devil. A humble person for years comes and says, I have this issue in my life and I'm working on it. I'm not a finished product, in other words. I'm a work in progress. God has not finished with me yet. God isn't done with me. I will make it. I have to fight on. That's why I've had disease been put into me. It's making me fight. Huh? It's there to motivate me. My problems are there to motivate me. My haters are my motivators. That's, oh, yes. Woo! Okay. That is my motto right now in my life. My haters are my motivators. I am motivated by all the hate out there huh? that has been spewed about me. Uh, all the lies. And they're pure lies. But it's my haters are my motivators. Woo! I love that one. Huh? To fight on. In other words, our victory is not in that we will be victorious over our problems. Because you will always have problems. Jesus said, the poor you will always have with you. There's always going to be stuff. There's always going to be wars. Always. You're always going to have things in your life. You're not going to be victorious in this life over your stuff. Your victory is in the struggle. If you continue every day to get up and say, I'm going to fight on. I am motivated. Mm. I am going, I am fighting on. I am motivated. That means you're victorious right there. You are victorious as long as you keep going. You get it? As long as you keep fighting the depression, the marital stuff, the fact that you haven't found someone in your life, that you don't give up, huh? that you keep fighting. That's your victory. The devil wants you to give up and fall into despair. It's part of pride. The prideful person comes and says, poor me, look at my sorry life. I won't make it. God has abandoned me. That is pride. Uh-huh. When I say, mm, God will save me. Mm. <laughs> and the prideful person says, no, my sins are too great for God to save me or forgive me. A lot of prideful people that come to confession or that come to talk to me. Oh, yeah. And they're like, look at me. My God has abandoned me. How dare you? Look at me, you say. Huh? My sins are too great for God to save me or forgive me. That's pride. 
You believe more in yourself than you do in God. When will God save me, people say. Well, you know, I don't know. It took God 40 years to save the Israelites from Egypt. Maybe in 40 years. Has it been 40 years? What is wrong with you, in other words? I'm asking that rhetorical question. What is wrong with you? And the pride-filled person continues to worship their sins. Adore your sins. Adore your past. Adore your mistakes. You say, I'm such a failure. Huh? Instead of saying, I failed in the past, but I am not a failure. Huh? The difference between humility and pride, between the tax collector and the Pharisee. One is focused on love and the other is focused on rules. Hmm? The pride-filled person says, I've been coming to church for years, going to confession for years, and nothing has changed. Whereas the humble person says, God is still working on me. I'll never forget, you know, this person used to come and see me for a very long time. And they used to always write down things in their notebook. They were fantastic. Okay, Father, you know, I'm working on this and that. Okay. You know, and I'm continuing to work. It was, that person was so humble. None of this attitude of, and you know, they, they had the same stuff every single time they would come. Well, most people would come and say, oh, why? It might take you a lifetime. So what? The pride-filled person says, I've been coming to church for years, going to confession for years, and nothing has changed. Whereas the humble person says, God is still working on me. When I was ordained a deacon, Philippians 1.6 was quoted. Philippians 1.6. I love Philippians, the letter to the Philippians. Not like in one of the churches where I was at. We have a lot of Filipinos here right now. So uh, this person was doing the reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. And they, they came up and they said, a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Filipinos. Laughter <laughs> By the way, the other book that I really recommend to all of you, we're going to hear from that book this coming weekend. I've already been working on my sermon for this coming weekend, actually. See, I start very early. I got up this morning at, I usually get up at 4, but today I got up at 3.30. Woo! Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. Start early. The best thing. And so we're going to hear from the letter to the, um, to the Hebrews, okay? Now, did, do you know about Moses? What is it that you have every morning? I had a lot of coffee. That's why I'm really wired right now. I had a quadruple espresso. Uh. <laughs> From Starbucks. Ooh, yeah. I welcome Starbucks cards. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> Speaking of Starbucks, uh, this one time I went there on, uh, on, on Halloween and I was dressed as a priest. Today I'm not dressed as a priest because I, I ran out of clerical shirts. So, and I want, I'd rather, you know, be fresh up and all that than smell like armpits. So, you know, <laughs> so I walk in and it was, it was Halloween and I was dressed like a priest, you know, and I'm in line. And uh, this person says to me, um, oh, I, they said, oh, this is an interesting outfit that you have on. And I didn't realize that. I, and I said, no, no. I said to the guy, I said, he was a young guy. I said, no, I'm, I'm really a priest. And he gets down on his knees and he says, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. <laughs> And 
and then after I proved that I was really a priest, because we got into a whole uh, conversation, he bought me my Starbucks. Uh -huh. Oh. <laughs> so that was good. <laughs> <laughs> but the letter to the Philippians, it's one of the letters of Paul. A guy I told you about today. In uh, chapter 1, verse 6 says, oh, I just passed Hebrews. Okay, so Philippians is after Ephesians. Verse 6 says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Did you hear that? He will bring it to completion. That's humility, that God is working on me. I am a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Never to give up. God isn't done with you and never will be. Only when you accept that you will never be a finished product here, then you will never be, that you will never be perfect will you be able to accept the fact that all those around you are unfinished as well. You understand why your husband is the way he is? You get it? Why your brother is the way he is? Uh, your kids, your co-workers, they're not finished products. Do you know why you should put up with your husband? Ladies, because he puts up with you. You understand? You know, you're not that easy to get to put up with. I mean, I hate to, you know, you think that you are, a lot of us, you know, we think we're the last Coca-Cola in the desert. You know, you're not. We really are not. You will... Accept that you will never be perfect. And the people around you are not perfect either. When Jesus says, be ye perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect, you know that word perfect in, uh, it, it was written in Greek, but Jesus is a, Jesus is a Jew. So this is a Hebrew concept. So then we go to the Old Testament and in the Old Testament, the idea of perfection is translated as hesed, which is mercy, compassion. So when Jesus says, be ye perfect, he's saying, be compassionate as your heavenly Father is compassionate. Be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful. That's perfection in the biblical sense, because you know, the New Testament is written in Greek. So they're giving you a Greek term for a Hebrew concept. They're, they're putting Greek in Jesus' mouth. He was a Jew. He spoke Aramaic. He knew Hebrew, of course, as well. Hmm? So none of us is perfect. The Beatitudes... Do you know those blessed are? They're called Beatitudes. Reread them. Matthew chapter, which? Which chapter? Five. Okay. Beatitudes. Are you hearing there? Beatitudes. That's why they're called Beatitudes. Attitudes of being, how we should be in our life. Blessed are you when you accept your hunger. It's your homework for this week to read the Beatitudes. Blessed are you when you are crying. When you are okay with crying. Nothing wrong with it. When you're weeping, when you're mourning, when you're being persecuted. What did he say? Rejoice and be glad. For yours is the kingdom of heaven. Hmm? Not when you don't when you have a problem free life but when you have haters and you've turned those haters into motivators <laughs> rejoice and be glad for yours is the kingdom of heaven 
It's okay to mourn. Give yourself permission, in other words, to be hungry. It's okay to be hungry. You all hungry? <laughs> I am, because I had my breakfast early. <laughs> but that's okay. I saw people br brought some donuts and things. Who brought, I, I, did, I, I think I saw something there. I hope so. Okay. <laughs> all right. Give yourself permission to not be okay. In other words. That American question, are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> Why do we have to be okay? It's okay not to be okay. Get up in the morning and say, it's okay that I'm not okay. And so what? I will be okay. I was okay before, I'll be okay again. Hmm? None of us is okay, in other words. So why do we ask that question here? We don't do that in Poland. We don't ask the question, are you okay? <laughs> We're all broken. We are all misfit toys, all of us. <laughs> Welcome to the island of the misfit toys. <laughs> well, you know, we've all got issues. He broke us, didn't he? This is my body. What did he say? Broken. For you. Only when I go through the cross did you understand what the cross is. Look at all the personalities of the Bible. They're all converted sinners. Abraham prostituted his wife. You all know that? Mm -hmm. no. Well, if you don't, well, it's in there. Google it, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you want that on your computer. Prostitution, <laughs> Abraham. <laughs> I wonder what's going to come up. I, I, I <laughs> Moses was a, an assassin. He killed an Egyptian. Everybody knows that one. David, you know, with Bathsheba. You know that whole story. Of course you do. Okay. You know that one. All right. And Peter. <gasps> Uh, and Paul, they're all misfits, betrayers, deniers. And yet, to all of these and to us, God says what? I want you. That's why I feel in good company. Mm -hmm. And you should feel in good company too. Because God wants each and every one of us like God wanted them. And each of them knew how to do one thing in their humility. They knew how to come back. Have you ever, have you ever focused on that? They didn't, they didn't stay stuck. They kept walking. They kept fighting. Whatever happened in their life was like this vaccine that puts disease in you, makes you fight. Huh? They knew how to come back. Paul was the best Pharisee of all. He knew all these rules and it only led him to grow in his pride. I, and then he says, I count all these things as nothing, says Paul. I count everything as nothing except my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Huh? In order to find the treasure buried in a field, if there's a treasure buried in a field, what do you have to do? To find the treasure. Bible speaks of that. You have to dig it out. Which means you're going to have to get dirty. Huh? In the dirt. Do the dirty digging. Do the dirty digging. Huh? Dig in the dirt. Do you know that story of the woman who turns the whole house upside down looking for the one lost coin. You know that story? Okay, so th this is Luke chapter 15. You can look all of these up for yourselves. This is being recorded right now, so you could look, look for it on Facebook. And she has 10 coins, and she turns the whole house upside down looking for the one lost coin. What is this whole thing about? There's a crisis there. 
She's turning the whole house upside down. She's looking for the one lost coin. She's got one coin that's missing. She had 10 and one is missing. So she's, she's turning over all the furniture, removing them from the being bolted in the ground. She turns the tables upside down in her home. She removes the furniture. In other words, remove the furniture in your home. Where's your home? In you, inside of you. What do we say before we go to communion? Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. My roof, my home, huh? It's in you. It's that whole story of Jesus overturning the money changing tables inside of the temple. What is that about? Where's the temple? The Bible teaches us we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Where's the temple? You, you are the temple. He's saying overturn the tables inside of you. Jesus wants to come in into us and cause a crisis. Is there a crisis in you? I hope so. There should be, you know, there always should be something going on in us because we should be constantly changing, not staying stuck. So wherever you are telling yourself in your pride, I won't or I can't, is a false humility. Stop it. Hmm? The weeds are needed in order for the wheat to grow fuller and better and richer. Jesus says, let the wheat and the weed grow together. Weed, the, the weed that you make um, bread from, he's talking about. He's not talking about the weed you, you smoke, okay? <laughs> <laughs> He's not talking about that weed. <laughs> All right. Let them grow together, the weeds and the wheat. It's hard for me to say all these things in English because they all sound so similar. But you all understanding what I'm talking about. Okay. Do not remove the weeds. The weeds are necessary. They shade. Do you know that? The bad stuff is necessary. You are bread. Bread comes from what? Wheat. But the weed needs the weeds, not the weeds, you know, the, okay? You don't need that, all right? But you need the bad stuff. You need the crisis. You need that disease in you. You get it? Bad things are necessary. Where was Jesus born? In a stable, in a cave, in the midst of filth, caca. Mm -hmm. Caca. <laughs> God was born there where something was lacking. <laughs> I crack myself up sometimes. Okay. <laughs> there was no abundance there. There was filth, manure. God is saying, I want to be born in your sin. In your filth in your problems, in your cave, in your barn, in the midst of your caca. <laughs> okay? I will be born there where there are problems, in the suffering, in the sickness, in your want, not in your abundance. I want to end by asking all of you this question today. When did God say to Jesus, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. In the river Jordan. When he was baptized. Jesus is soaking wet. He looks like a mess. He's looking ridiculous. Same thing happened at your baptism. Hmm? In a filthy and smelly river. Mm-hmm not looking pretty and put together and all perfumed and wearing Gucci, 
Gucci or Prada <laughs> in designer clothes. No, he was soaking wet. So God has looked, as Mary says, with favor on his lowly servant. In the Magnificat, she says that, you know, in her lacking, in her hunger. God is pleased with her want. Mm. All of this is just to let all of you know that we need to fight the hell in us, not to run from the hell. Mm. Don't run from it, but fight it. That's the only way to heaven, to fight it. Huh? The good times for the church in the early church were during the persecution. The good times for the church in Poland were during the communism. Not now. Now there's less and less and less and less people going to church. You know, the church was at its height under communist oppression. It's during the crisis uh, that we do the best. When did we come together as a nation? 9-11, didn't we? You know, all of us, we were not Republicans and Democrats anymore. We were not Trumpites and Hillarites, okay? <laughs> we were just Americans, huh? It's in the crisis. Embrace the crisis. Thank you, Lord. It's all good for me because I know you love me. Hmm? And God is there to help us. I'm going to be putting up on Facebook the testimony of a gentleman um, who is uh, currently right now at Sunrise Hospital. His name is Silvio. And he has been there for four months. Uh huh. And he had a big hole in his foot that wasn't healing at all. Until he got my holy packet, my holy and exercised oil. And the, he got it on September 14th, the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross. September 14th, he got the packet with the holy and blessed and exercised salt and holy and blessed and exercised water and the holy oil and everything that the holy packet contains and he began using it and now the wound that he had a diabetic wound has began to heal so much so that on the 28th which is this week he's going home and I have the pictures to prove it, and I'll be putting it up on Facebook. For four months! Nothing was happening. But faith mm, moves mountains, doesn't it? When you have faith, you have it all. Mm, there's nothing impossible for Jesus. Huh? Nothing impossible for Jesus. So much so that he was told he was going to have his foot amputated. Yeah, they were going to do the amputation. And somebody told them, reach out to Father Adam. And he did. And he got my holy packet. And now he's coming home. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's faith. So I recommend everybody starts using the blessed and holy oil. Are you, hopefully you're doing that. We have lots of testimonies. You know, Christy, whom a lot of you know, you know, she has used it and you know she's had a miraculous recovery from her cancer so i mean you know there's just one testimony after another that's what faith is that's why i'm here for your faith to boost your faith so how many of you have the the holy packet okay those of you who don't you need to get it it's right there okay you know, and start using it, okay? So it's very, very important. What time is it? Because I can talk for... 11.08. 11.08. Oh, my gosh, I ran over. Sorry. Um, I'm supposed to end at 11. So thank you so very much.
Thank you so 